I, I did this residency while I was working on a body of work, or at least starting a body of work, a new body of work, and I had a vague idea of the direction I wanted to take the work in. I had been weaving very square, um, finished carpets or tapestries or whatever, and um, was a little bit frustrated with that square format. And of course, through the process of making, you realize that there's all these other possibilities with the material and the making itself that could end up in other directions. So I started with looking at what's happening in my own studio, whatever I've accumulated. I have a tendency to hold on to every little thing. So, <laughs> so every time I would clean my space, I would of course go through the heap of rubbish to keep little bags of off cuts and even sometimes the sand with all the tiny broken beads in there that I would keep in bags, which I'm not sure why. Um, so then the body of work started by looking at whatever I had accumulated from the start. Yet one of the main works in that body of work was also the way I'd worked in the past was to have this piece of thing in my studio where I could just vent my creative frustrations on and just like make shit, you know, deliberately you know, not care. And then from, from that process, I could then choose things and, that I could build on that I thought was exciting. Um, in this case, the actual thing that became that was meant to not be a thing turned into the, an artwork that I was very excited about and, and developed. Um, and so during all of this, so we were doing the residency visiting uh, the, all um, the three different companies that we went to. And so the, 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 the the materials I tried really to slot into everything I had already accumulated and was accumulating. Um, for the works that you see here, the, um, I suppose I wanted to expose the beauty of the material as I saw its potential and give it structure because it's soft. It uh, was the first thing I started with. As you, you see with this material, I, uh, around the edge I had stitched onto it a very thick wire so that I could then bend it and twist it, of course, and, and, um, and simply give it some form, um, but not uh, control it too much, also. Yeah. Let it be. Okay. <laughs> let it, just let it happen. I wanted just to break up because I thought that these, it was quite flat, you know. I like the, the tone, the playing on, of the greys and the browns, but parts of it were so flat and I thought that these lines would just diffuse it and break it up a little bit. And there's a little bit of a leaves or something. Yeah, but starting with a flat material like that, you're, it's quite an easy default to go back to the square format with a flat format in any case. Exactly. That's a challenge, I guess. Um, yeah, and so it, it was all along part of that body of work and it actually kind of was supposed to serve this important aspect of that body, which is, you know, I thought that it had this nice kind of sinister and darker feel that would have added, would have contrasted what was going on with that, with the other works. And uh, especially when I start the body of work, I just enjoy discovering things and materials. So, and then looking at its potential. Many people seem to know, even the Afrikaans, I mean, it's an old word. But anyway, what it means, there's kind of two meanings. The one is stofflicko oorskot, which is human remains. Um, and then the other, of course, is remnants, either things left behind or excess, surplus, you know. Um, but yeah, the, I guess the, the title in some regard, in the one in God refers to where I left off with that performance with my father where I basically died. And um, the other part of it was, of course, the starting, whatever was the, all the leftovers in my studio. Like, um, in one of the work, actually, there was things, leftover material from every body of work that I've ever created um, that, that I just had all of these things in bags that ended up in this one piece. Um, and then beyond all of that, conceptually, what I, I think the starting point was, I went to Panama and I was quite inspired about how these things grow, these in the jungle, we went out in the jungle and how the, all of these ivy, these creeper plants discover 
th these trees and create amazing shapes and um, I'm just really interested in how the plant would move in space and over uh, objects and and that became the starting point I i had been thinking about this before since I heard this little story I, I'm Muslim and uh, I'm very interested in the Sufi concepts of Islam, you know, the mystical side, the things that cannot be proven <laughs> and can never really know. Um, and one of the stories that my teacher uh, is told us was about, well, actually I asked her what was the, what, from her point of view, how does she feel, how, what does she think about creativity itself, you know. Uh, um, and she, she, she said that the importance of creativity is the entire universe, from the Quranic, from Sufi point of view, was created purely with creativity. And she was telling me the story of, if you think about water dripping after, ta after a while, uh, moss would start to grow, and, and that whole process is due to the energy of creativity. And that kind of shifted the way I looked at my own practice and how I, before, of course, you think of an artwork coming from you, and then I kind of thought of me engaging with creativity through the use of material and uh, you know so it just shifted how I looked at how I approached the work and looked at the whole process and so I drew a little bit about the from the plants and moss and greens and all of that green was a strong feature in the exhibition um, and then yeah try to pull these ideas together with material and thought that felt was you know, wool fibers put together in a random way and kind of wet and, uh, and compressed. But I learned that they were actually laminated, that you, you lay fibers down facing one direction, like a warp, mm -hmm. and then you lay the next layer down in the opposite direction. So it, it is like weaving in a way, but the, 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 you're not w weaving the warp and weft together. They're kind of sticking together because the, the wool has got little barbs in it. And when you wet the wool those, and, and you put soap in it, it agitates the the, the fibres and they snag onto each other. Yeah, cool. And quite a lot of the difficult part of what she does is that she has to take into account the fact that um, these fibres shrink. So she works with two different kinds of fibres. One wool from sheep, I think merino wool, and then mohair, which is technically not, you can't call it wool, but is that right? I think so, yeah. Uh, they, they, everything gets sort of soaked up. She uses a, she does, she doesn't like to use toxic materials, so she uses a, something called earth sap or something, which is a, a, a soap without solvents and parabens and what have you. And uh, then they use bubble wrap. They put bubble wrap on top of the felt and they roll a little lap and, and there was all this beautiful silvery light and it was... I, I used to feel very kind of visually stimulated by going out there and my wife actually noticed it because I'd come back with lots of photographs of, you know, shards of light and stuff. Anyway, so I... I became interested at first in the idea that these different fibers shrunk at different rates. So the mohair shrunk, I don't know, to 80% of its size and the wool shrank to more. I can't, I can't remember. It's and so I thought about how we could use that to, to, to engineer a fabric, say, and to produce volume or, or relief or depth or something in a, in a fabric by arranging the way we arrange the, uh, by organizing the way we arrange these fibers. And I started looking at typical fabrics, uh, and, and the one that kind of stuck in my mind was what we would call a gingham, which is like a cheap Italian restaurant tablecloth, you know, with red and white stripes on the warp and red and white stripes on the weft, and you end up with, with three different tones. You get a white, yeah. a pure red, and then a mix. And so we ended up doing a process a little bit like that, but instead of using different colors, we used different fibers. And I thought I was being very clever. And, and it took a few goes, but eventually we were able to make a, a felt fabric that had raised bumps in it, blisters, if you like. It looked like, like you were making ravioli and you hadn't, uh, on a whole sheet and you hadn't yet cut it up into the little parcels. Not, I know that's not how you know, make ravioli, but if you did. <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember actually what spurred the idea. It was a misunderstanding. Because the first day I went there, Stephanie was making a, a felt throw that someone had commissioned for me, and I didn't think clearly about what a throw was, and I, I was thinking it was like a shawl. 
I mean, no, 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 no. That's what she was making. I was thinking she meant something to go on a bed. And I started thinking about uh, seersucker fabric. I don't know if you'll probably recognize it. It's not strictly, but typically it is produced in stripes of, of contrasting colors like a blue and a white. And the threads in the warp or the weft are tightened uh, periodically uh, in a regular fashion. But, and so it causes the, the, the fabric yeah. to kind of buckle in bits. And it, it was made to do that because it holds the fabric away from your skin and allows air circulation, so it keeps you cool. So it's a typical kind of piece of colonial weaving, uh, you know, in the colonies in India and Africa and stuff where honkies wanted to stay cool. But the, the you know, that's kind of inherent. You, you can see how that looks like a sheep. It does keep something of the <laughs> texture. Lie, it's been like you know, two years, yeah. So on hindsight, do you feel it's had any, what impact has it had on the last two years? Well, I always have, um, you know, I always have a sort of slight interest in, in product development. I, I've, I somehow taught for a little while in an industrial design department at, at the, what, the, what was the Cape Technicon. And um, I spent quite a bit of time in that department, so I, I kind of got exposed to product and industrial design. And, uh, you know, if you, maybe not in m my finished works, but in a lot of my sort of development of prototypes and models and stuff, I use people, who, model makers and machinists and things like that. And I, I make the odd bicycle part and do stuff like that. So, you know, it, it felt like it was on a continuum with that, but I've never successfully developed anything. I, I don't have that kind of entrepreneurial ambition, perhaps. Um, I like the sort of the woolly creative stuff and the, and, and, and the kind of precise technical stuff that I'm able to overlay. I, I work quite a lot in AutoCAD and that kind of stuff. So I like kind of industrial precision and industrial processes. And the idea of engineering a fabric, yeah, that does, that does interest me. And, but you know, there are, I, I suppose I would convince myself not to do it because I would think that there are a lot of m much cleverer people than me who spend the all day every day doing this and yeah okay well I suppose since seeing Stephanie I did do a bit of work using an industrial process in a handmade way I, I made a lot of works from brick clay and had it fired in a big brickyard and and what I did was on such a small scale that I never even paid a cent for it it didn't even make a dent <laughs> so I, I can see, you know, how my creative process can insert itself into an industrial process at a different scale, perhaps. Mm -hmm.